Sabal Khair, everyone. Good morning, or Masail Khair, good evening, depending on where you are in the world and when you are joining me for the next episode of the Egypt Travel Podcast. This episode is going to be a short one and on a very specific topic. And by the way, if you haven't found out or heard about and then subscribed to the Egypt Travel channel on YouTube yet, then please stop this podcast real fast. Go put it in the search bar in YouTube and subscribe to it real quick so that you have it bookmarked and also click the little bell icon so that you receive notifications when new videos, shorts, video podcasts, and other insider material about Egypt is released there. If you already follow the Egypt Travel Channel over on YouTube, you'll notice that I've been gradually moving more towards that platform, even for the podcast, and that some episodes from there don't even make it onto the audio-only version of the podcast because those episodes are created specifically for the video format and just wouldn't make sense during certain portions if they were audio only and you didn't have the video to go along with it to know what I'm talking about. So, the Egypt Travel Channel on YouTube, which you can easily find by either just searching YouTube for it or we made it easy for you. Just go to theegypttravelchannel.com and I've set up a redirect there so that it automatically takes you to the correct YouTube page to find the channel, not some imitation channel. Now, don't be fooled, folks. If it's not me, John Navarre, it's not the Egypt Travel Channel or the Egypt Travel Podcast or the Egypt Travel Video Podcast or the Egypt History and Culture Podcast, all of which I personally produce and host. We've actually had that imposter problem before with my travel company and tour operator in Egypt, which is called Egypt Elite and which is certainly a one-of-a-kind and not like any other travel company or tour operator in the whole country, that's for sure. But we've seriously had people and companies try to set up fake Facebook pages and websites with our company name before and try to get visitors to Egypt to book with them by hijacking our stellar reputation. But what they can't imitate is our operation on the ground here in Egypt, which is why some folks got suspicious when they thought they were communicating with us here at Egypt Elite, but they had actually fallen for an imposter. Folks, if you think you're ever communicating with Egypt Elite and the emails are not coming from someone at EgyptElite.com, that's not us. That should be a red flag. Or if the English is broken or not making sense, that's not us either because all of our client-facing staff, which work with you on trip planning prior to booking a trip with us, are all native English speakers. They don't have broken English or bad grammar, trust me. As they say, the best are often imitated but never duplicated. There's only one true Egypt elite here in Egypt, and that's where you'll find me and my excellent team. Anyway, I digress. What I'm here to talk about today is flights and airports, specifically domestic flights and domestic airports within Egypt where you can fly, where you can't fly, where you have to fly, where you should not fly, and all about domestic flights and routes within Egypt. We're going to start with that anyway. Keep in mind, Egypt is a big country. If you want to see the major top-tier sites and monuments in Egypt, you have to take at least one domestic flight during your visit, and most likely two. Okay, first, let me explain what I mean by that. The overwhelming majority of international flights to and from Egypt, go into and out of Cairo International Airport, which is on the far eastern side of Greater Cairo. When I say Greater Cairo, I'm talking about the Greater Cairo metropolitan area. Many of you have heard me talk about that distinction before. Although, that may be changing in the not-too-distant future because a brand new airport has already opened on the far western side of the Cairo metropolitan area, over to the northwest of Giza. They've already started what's essentially a public trial opening phase of that airport, just like they're doing with the Grand Egyptian Museum. Oh, and by the way, make sure you check out grandegyptianmuseum.org if you want to get on the list for the insider updates on what's going on there at the gym. But the trial phase of the new airport in Giza, which is called Sphinx International Airport, by the way, I know it's not very creative, but it is what it is, that's only seeing a few flights a day coming in, mainly from one or two cities in Germany, Italy, and Saudi Arabia, 
Kuwait, a few other places in Europe and the Middle East once or twice a week. So not a lot of international air traffic into or out of that airport yet. They had some domestic flights going there too, but those seem to have stopped for now. So still, as it's been for thousands of years in Egypt, if aliens built the pyramids, I guess, uh, Cairo International Airport, or CAI, is the main airport to fly into in Egypt to visit and to leave back out of Egypt when you're done. However, there are international flights into and out of four other smaller airports in Egypt, and the number of international flights going direct to those airports has actually been increasing lately. Those other airports are Sharm el Sheikh at the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula on the Red Sea, Hurghada, also on the Red Sea, but on the mainland coast of Egypt, Alexandria on Egypt's northern Mediterranean coast, and Luxor, the center of what I call the land of tombs and temples in the south of Egypt. Now, the reason I tell you all of this is even though 95% of you will still fly into and out of Cairo when you come to visit Egypt, it's because the uptick in direct flights from Europe has opened up more options for travelers, especially on departure. So why departure and not arrival too? Well, technically you could fly into one of those other cities around Egypt and start your trip around the country there. But most people, nearly everyone in fact, start their visit to Egypt in Cairo because that's where the most famous historical monuments in all of Egypt, and I would argue in all of the world, are located. For example, the pyramids, which are just outside of Cairo's western suburb of Giza. You can basically consider Cairo and Giza one and the same, like we do here in Egypt, which is what I was talking about earlier. And that's why we often sometimes refer to the area as the Greater Cairo Metropolitan Area. Technically, Cairo is on the eastern bank of the Nile River, and Giza is on the western bank of the river. But we still call the whole area Cairo, unless you're giving directions to a local place, and then you'll need to be specific if it's in Cairo or Giza, because that determines which side of the river you're going to, or which one you're looking at on the map. You can think of Cairo and Giza kind of like the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, if you're familiar with U.S. geography, or Dallas and Fort Worth. Two cities merged into one large metropolitan area, and sometimes referred to jointly, but often just referenced by the more dominant and more famous city. Now, although you've clearly heard of Cairo, and you've likely already heard of Giza too, because of, and you know what I'm about to say, right? The Pyramids of Giza, the most famous historical monument in the entire world, I would argue, and the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that has stood the test of time and is still left standing today. All the rest were gone long ago, including another one, by the way, in Egypt. Bonus points if you know that one. And by the pyramids of Giza are likely why you wanted to visit Egypt your whole life, right? And why you're planning a trip here now, or at least thinking about it, I presume if you're listening to this podcast. So this is why nearly everyone flies into and out of Cairo and starts their visit around Egypt in Cairo and Giza, because that's where the pyramids are. Everyone wants to see the pyramids of Giza first, and those are in the greater Cairo area. Now, most people also come back to Cairo to fly out because historically, Cairo International Airport has been the place where most flights out of the country flew from and where you could find the most departure options and the best prices. So generally, people have always, and mostly still do, fly into Cairo. They tour the whole country from stem to stern, and then they return to Cairo to fly back out of Egypt. But like I said, there are now some additional international departure options that don't require you to travel all the way back to Cairo to fly out. The two main cities that would allow you to do a one-way journey around Egypt and not have to return back to Cairo at the end are Sharm el-Sheikh and Hurghada. These are the main hubs for Egypt's Red Sea coastal tourism. So when visitors to Egypt are ending their trips with a few days at a resort on the Red Sea, there are some decent options for beginning your journey back home directly from the Red Sea. One of my favorite airlines to fly is actually Turkish Airlines for so many reasons. Whether you fly out of Cairo or not, you always have a connection in Istanbul on Turkish Airlines because that's its hub. But Turkish Airlines also has daily flights out of both Hurghada on Egypt's mainland Red Sea coast and Sharm el-Sheikh on Egypt's Sinai Red Sea coast. Actually, they now have them out of Alexandria too. 
So that makes it easy and convenient to fly Turkish from wherever you are into Cairo to start your visit, tour the whole country, end at the Red Sea or Alexandria, and then fly out of Egypt directly from one of those Red Sea or Mediterranean Sea hubs. Other airlines that fly out of other cities in Egypt like Hergada and Sharm are going to be mostly European airlines like Swiss Air, EasyJet, Condor, and a few other European discount and budget airlines. So be sure to check around if you're interested in having a one-way journey around Egypt that starts in Cairo but ends somewhere else to save you time in your itinerary so you don't have to go back to Cairo to fly out. On occasion, you can also find an Egypt air flight directly to or from Luxor as well to a few European cities. Two years ago, I discovered a once-a-week flight between Madrid and Luxor, and I took advantage of it one time when I was flying back to Egypt with a lot of luggage that actually needed to get down to our base in Luxor anyway. So I took that direct flight from Spain, where I live, to Luxor, and I didn't have to even connect in Cairo. Of course, if you live in Spain or you're also connecting in Spain, that also gives you the opportunity to finish touring Egypt and Luxor and fly directly out of Luxor to get back to Europe without needing to return to Cairo to depart Egypt. The same can go for London and a few other cities in Europe. But the main overarching point of all of this is to show you that Cairo is not your only option anymore for flying out of Egypt or even into Egypt. Now, while I'd still highly recommend starting your visit to Egypt in Cairo, because the number one thing that you're going to want to see, unless you've been to Egypt before and you're skipping it, is the Giza Pyramids complex, which is directly adjacent to the greater Cairo area. But we're getting more and more options from more convenient places around Egypt to end a tour of Egypt and depart the country. So while your natural tendency when searching for international flights to and from Egypt is to just do a simple round trip search from your home airport to Cairo, hopefully this new insight I'm sharing here on expanding international flight options for more cities in Egypt will inspire you to dig a little deeper when you're doing your international flight searches and consider potentially more convenient departures from another city in Egypt if that city is going to be on your itinerary anyway. So remember, if you're planning a visit to Luxor, Alexandria, or anywhere on the Red Sea, where the main airports are Sharm el-Sheikh and Hergada, remember, search for flights that are one way into Cairo and one way out of one of those other cities to see if you can find a flight sequence that works better instead of having to go all the way back to Cairo to depart. And remember, this will also save you the cost of your flight back to Cairo, and often the cost of an extra night of hotel if you have to go back to Cairo and then stay overnight at the airport hotel in order to make your Cairo departure work. And with that, I'll bid you all happy flight searching and another farewell from the Egypt Travel Podcast. Don't forget to also subscribe to the Egypt Travel Channel on YouTube for more from me about travel to and around Egypt on video and a lot more, by the way, that's not available on the audio podcast. Masalama, everyone.